five and a half million Americans currently suffer from Alzheimer's disease and 15 million people serve as caregivers. This crippling disease offers challenges as well as frustrations for the patient as well as the caregiver. Today on Weekend Connection, we'll discuss the physical and emotional stresses of Alzheimer's and how it can deal a crippling blow to the emotions and relationships within the family. Now, let's get connected. Our guest today on Weekend Connection is Dr. Judith Bohannon. She taught family studies at the University of Tennessee, Kansas State University, and East Carolina University. Judith knows the challenges and frustrations that accompany the crippling disease of Alzheimer's as she was a caregiver to her husband. Judith, welcome to the broadcast today. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Judith, as you find out that a loved one has Alzheimer's disease, Having a knowledgeable and compassionate doctor can't be overlooked. I can imagine that that would add to the stress level if people hesitated to ask their doctor any questions they might have. Perhaps they have a fear of bothering them too much. I do believe that it is important to have a lot of confidence in your primary care physician. And if that person is not someone you feel like you can speak with, frankly, about Alzheimer's, then... Perhaps you might want to look for a geriatrician, which is a physician specializing in aging problems, specifically dementia. And I found that to be a good source with my husband. The physician was very caring and gave me a lot of good advice and good information. A neurologist will work with the patient initially, and some people stay with the neurologist and others move either back to their primary care physician or, as I say, find a physician who specializes in age-related illnesses. As we mentioned, Judith, you were the caregiver to your husband, and in your experience, did you find that there were specific times of the day when your husband was less confused or more cooperative? Were you able to develop a routine that made things go more smoothly? I think that probably the evening is a time when both the patient, the Alzheimer's patient, and the caregiver are tired. And so I don't think that that period of time is the optimum time uh, for either one. I think the middle of the day is always a good time. The other thing, though, with that is that you're going to have good days and bad days. So some days may be bad for the full 24 hours. And by bad, I'm referring to the person has fewer cognitive abilities, they may be fussier, they may be a lot more confused and ask more questions, and other days that may not be the case. Now for those who don't know what sundowning is, uh, why is it so unusual and why does it have the potential to be scary? Well, sundowning is a phenomenon, I would call it, that occurs sometimes with people who are older and particularly people who have dementia. And it is not a condition that I believe medical professions talk a lot to the potential caregiver about. In my book, Sleep Tight, I have a an episode in there where Maggie, the protagonist, deals with her husband And I wanted to use that as a learning tool for the reader, even though it's a book of fiction. Because in this case, in sundowning, the person will probably become someone the caregiver doesn't even recognize. Even their appearance can change, but they're definitely in a different place. They have no cognitive ability. You cannot reason with them. They are very um, determined that they're probably going to get out of the bed, the house, whatever it is that seems to be in their own minds trapping them. And if they're in the hospital, they're often restrained with um, some sort of a restraint that ties their arms to their chest. I mean, the hospital people that I dealt with with this phenomenon were wonderful And it's not anything that is painful at all, but the person has no ability to stay in the bed or to not do something that would harm themselves. 
And it seems to come at night, and that's the reason for the name sundowning. It comes as the sun goes down, and it is gone in the morning most of the time. And again, it's one of those things that you're not anticipating. If you don't, if you've never heard about it, or if your physician has not told you to expect that this could happen. Judith, you referenced your novel, Sleep Tight. Uh, What was the purpose behind writing this particular novel? Well, I wanted this to be a story about a strong woman who had strong Christian principles, but she was also vulnerable. I, I wanted her to have most of the answers, but not all of them. I wanted her to try to always live a Christ-centered life, and I think for most of us, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself, I want to do that, but I don't always find that so easy. So she has an Achilles heel, and the reader gets to see that. And she also, of course, is dealing with Carson, her husband, who does have Alzheimer's. He isn't the only person in the story, and he does die about halfway through the story. So then she has other issues she has to deal with. I think the book is... As I mentioned earlier about sundowning, I think it also is a teaching tool for people who are caregivers. I think they can see Maggie's emotions. They're sometimes pretty raw, and um, they're, they can be sad. They can be happy when Carson recognizes her, and, and they have some interactive communication that is productive, and then other times they don't, So, which I think is very true to what the Alzheimer's patient and the caregiver are going to experience. Author Judith Bohannon is our guest today on Weekend Connection on the Bible Broadcasting Network. She knows the challenges and frustrations that accompany this crippling disease, Alzheimer's. She was a caregiver to her husband, which allowed her to see the physical and emotional stresses of the illness. Judith, research has shown that caregivers themselves often are at increased risk for depression and illness. Does feelings of selfishness creep in if one considers using respite services just to take a break from their family member? Stephen, I certainly think those feelings of selfishness do creep in. But the thing that I have said to myself and it didn't originate with me. I had certainly read it or heard it. But I told myself this, and I have told other people who've talked with me about this, that the best thing that you can do for the patient is to take care of yourself. I see people who have kept their uh, patient in the home the entire time, and they are both physically tired, emotionally tired, and I think their spirit is diminished. I don't know that that serves the Alzheimer's victim well. I think that if you can be a very cheerful, happy person for 24 hours, that's wonderful. If you can answer the questions that are asked you over and over and over and not lose patience, that's wonderful. But I do not see people who do that very well, and I certainly did not do it well. I recognized probably two or three years before my husband died, that I was a better person for him to be around if I was not with him 24 hours. Because many times you're up in the night with the person, and sometimes it's all night, and it may be two or three nights in a row that you're up all night. And physically, a caregiver cannot stand that and not lose a lot of their own health. So I would encourage your listeners that if they are struggling with whether or not to find respite care in whatever form it may be for themselves, that they do that. I have friends who are now struggling with husbands who who have Alzheimer's, and I have encouraged them to do this. At least get someone to come into your home several hours during the day to give you a break. For one thing, you'll need to go for your own doctor's appointments or any sort of appointment that you may need to to attend to. So you'll need someone there with them during that time. It becomes very difficult to take them with you. You can't generally go to a doctor's appointment without taking them into the room with you because I found with my husband, if I left him in the waiting room, that pretty soon he was 
talking to the nurses and the receptionists about where's my wife, where's my wife, I want my wife. And so they had to find me, and that just became burdensome for the people who were there in the office as well as a struggle for me. And Judith, in a related point, because you're so caught up in the moment in caring for an Alzheimer's patient, I guess it would be easy to not plan for the future, but the paperwork and phone calls uh, have to be endless. Yes, they are. And I would also recommend to listeners that you get a power of attorney for both your spouse's health care power of attorney and also a financial power of attorney so that you can deal with the health care issues and also with any financial issues. I think this is just critical, and you can't wait until the person is so far into dementia that a lawyer cannot sign to say that they were of sound mind. So that needs to be taken care of early on in the process when you suspect that they have Alzheimer's. I had both of those powers of attorney only because my husband's lawyer said to me, you're going to need these. And I have thanked him over and over for that because that was so true. It made my work so much easier. We're talking to Judith Bohannon today on Weekend Connection. Her book, Sleep Tight, helps readers see the difficulties in emotions and relationships as it relates to Alzheimer's and how one woman struggled to make these two entities consistent with her faith. Uh, Judith, uh, trying to communicate with a person with Alzheimer's disease must be a challenge and I'm sure requires uh, some skill and a heavy dose of patience. Well, I often have said to people that I prayed for patience every morning and I prayed for forgiveness every night because I was not as patient as I wanted to be during those 12 to 16 hours. I think it does take a lot of patience, which is another reason that perhaps the caregiver needs to look for some form of respite care. Sometimes it can just be family members who come in, or other times it's actually putting your loved one into a facility, which I did with my husband for the last two years. He became a total lift patient, so I did not feel that I could could lift him and stay healthy myself. So that was a, a judgment call on my part. And also the doctors had recommended it at one point, so... You know, everybody's situation is a little different, but the patience factor is certainly there. You know, the person may ask you 25 times, what day is it? And you will answer that 25 times, and the 26th time you just kind of lose it and say, you know, I've told you over and over it is, you know, first day of May. That, I believe, is probably fairly typical with most people, certainly the Alzheimer's victim is going to ask questions over and over because they don't remember it. And they have no recollection that they've asked you that 25 times. For them, it's the first time they've asked it. So they don't know why you are impatient with them either. And, of course, that's difficult for them and it's difficult for you. Judith, as we conclude the broadcast today, are there organizations that would offer more information about the disease and treatment options? Yes, I think today we have such good facilities for that. There are lots of local organizations, too. The Area Agency on Aging is a good place to start, and that is in almost every location. There are support groups. The medical profession can put you in touch with those. And certainly online you can go to the Alzheimer's Association 24-7 helpline, and that helps the provider know more about memory loss and things to expect and not to expect. There are books and booklets out there that give great information. Uh, The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs also will help caregivers in what they need to know about getting help. NIH, the National Institute of Health, has an Alzheimer's Disease Education Center, but online you can find all of those sources. So I think that that would be very beneficial to anyone who is a caregiver to get online and look for those. We have been talking to Judith Bohannon today on Weekend Connection pertaining to the crippling disease of Alzheimer's. Judith, thank you for joining us on the broadcast today, and 
We look forward to your novel, Sleep Tight. Thank you so much, Stephen. I do appreciate your calling, and I appreciate this opportunity to share my experiences with Alzheimer's and Sleep Tight with you. Thank you for listening to this feature, a production of BBN, the Bible Broadcasting Network. BBN provides 24-hour Christian programming, great Christian music and Bible teaching. Listen to BBN by clicking the link in the description.